Hello again, everyone. I'm Professor Lusheen, and this is Lecture 16 for Safety 380, Intro to Occupational Safety and Health. Um, rest assured, this one will be shorter than the last one. Last one was pretty long, <laughs> but I covered a lot of things. And I also want you to be still, if you haven't yet, uh, be thinking about which option you want to do for the semester project and report it this week in the uh, in the assignment. So we're going to talk about hazard con the hazard control hierarchy and safety training, and then. These topics will be uh, reintroduced uh, as we go through each of the different types of hazards for the remainder of the semester. So we'll go over the different aspects of it. Again, this will be pretty quick. Uh, there's a lot of reading for this particular lecture, four chapters. Uh, I don't expect you to read and memorize, but the, uh, the study sheet should help as a guide. Um, I just want you to get the basic awareness level um, from these four things. So here is a one version of the hazard control hierarchy. Eliminations up on the top. And if you'll remember or recall from the last lecture, I had said that as we analyze the work environment, assess the work environment for hazards, um, and attempt to control it, if we can eliminate it, it's no longer part of the safety program. It doesn't have to be. It's gone. And uh, and so it's it, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of savings and there's a lot of effectiveness um, with that approach. But sometimes it cannot be eliminated. Sometimes it's just too expensive. Substitution is an option. Um, you know, you don't want your workers to be exposed to a fall hazard. So you hire a contractor. So, you know, your workers aren't being exposed to it, but, you know, the other contractors are. Or if there's a chemical that's really hazardous and you can find a substitute that uh, has the same properties and still works, but isn't as toxic to humans. Those are just some basic examples. Engineering is a little bit more standard. That would be a um, the design of guarding um, or some sort of mitigating design in the work environment that the hazards there, if somebody goes around the engineering control, they can still get exposed, but there are things you can put in place to um, minimize that chance. Administrative, you're basically, um, Rotating people around or giving them signage, you're, you're, it, it, that goes into behavior. You know, you're, you're attempting to have the worker control their own safety, which, which isn't really what the general duty clause calls for. And then the final is personal protective equipment. That, unfortunately, is the place where most employers go first uh, because it's the least expensive. Uh, companies who sell PPE... Um, do a very good job with advertising and promoting it. Uh, the issue is um, the person who uses it, one, they have to use it. Two, they have to use it properly. Three, they have to know when to detect when it's no longer effective. Four, there are some forms of PPE that act, could actually cause a hazard in itself. Um, a respirator, for for example. Um, if you're not, Or if you're not wearing the personal fall arrest system properly, you're not tying it off. So they're... There's a, there's a lot of things that can either go wrong or make things worse with personal protective equipment, but it's inexpensive. So elimination comes through planning and design. So there's an approach called safety through design or prevention through a design in which engineers, architects, safety professionals sit down together. I'm sorry. Uh, and the uh, it's typically used with like construction sites and they, attend, they, they try to understand the project from um, the first day in which a shovel goes into the dirt to the final day in which they're cutting the ribbon, um, where risks or hazard could develop during the project, and then they eliminate it out, get it out of the way. And sometimes the way things are designed for the building, it creates hazards. That You've got contractors on top of each other creating hazards for each other. And then there's a definition here. It's just, it's a very, it relies very heavily on, on computer uh, design. Uh, and as you can see on the bottom, the gentleman is wearing a, an Oculus. And so you can actually walk through these sites and they can show it. Um, they, you can get a three-dimensional view of the job site, but also a fourth dimension. And that is through time. So as time develops, what could possibly get in the way? And then what designers and architects can do, draftsmen, can they can actually redesign 
maybe how the mechanicals are put in or when they're put in or the overhead crane there so it won't bump into things. So there's a lot of things they can do to mitigate safety before, again, a, a shovel breaks ground. So here's just a, you know, a pre-thought versus an afterthought. And unfortunately, um, and you, I had indicated this in uh, the last lecture, that sometimes safety is just, it. let's just hope everybody practices common sense and nothing goes wrong. So um, if you're not actively trying to prevent exposure, you're going to be actively responding to accidents. That's basically it. So there are a lot of benefits, but it requires you know, people who are knowledgeable, uh, people who plan ahead. I'm not really that kind of person uh, in my own personal life. Uh, but there's a lot to be gained, and but it is more expensive. It really is not more expensive. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. It is expensive. It's an expensive upfront cost to do the designing for safety, the prevention through design, but the payoff is considerable. All right, let's shift gears to safeguarding. Um, machine guarding is a fairly common thing. Uh, Sometimes it's sold with the equipment. Older equipment doesn't have it, and a company has to retrofit. And also, the um, even though OSHA has standards assigned to this, NIOSH has machine safety page. It's the ANSI standard, the consensus standard, that really kind of guides or leads the, leads the industry. And as you can see here, you can purchase those through ASSP. I don't expect you to purchase them. You can actually go to a, um, a, uh, a provider um, or a uh, design firm that does machine safeguarding, and they will break down the ANSI standards um, for you. So you could go to Rockford Systems. They're my go-to um, if I have questions uh, about machine safeguarding. They tend to be experts. So the pictures I have here, you got a light curtain in the upper left. It's a presence sensing device. You can actually have... Um, floor mats that have presence sensing as well. Um, the idea is when, you know, when the light beam is broken, uh, the machine is, is turned off or, you know, the, the cycle's ended. On the right, that's probably the most common, that's a fixed guard. The basic idea of a fixed guard is it covers what it needs to, and it needs, in order to be removed, you need to use a tool to remove it. That's considered a fixed guard. On the bottom, we've got a two-hand actuator, which looks to be also a, an adjustable guard. And then on the right bottom, we have just fencing. And so we put fencing around uh, robots. So when robots in there, there are some more advanced uh, robots now that actually are equipped with present sensing devices so that you don't even need the gates anymore because if it, if it was to, if it, Realize that a human's next to it, it won't hit the human, which that's a very, very new thing because um, typically robots go where they're programmed to go and they don't really look out for people. They don't have that capability, but apparently there is a new technology that allows that to happen. But that's a very new thing. There are different types of machine hazards. Um, you can see the picture here. There's a lot of ways in which machines, as they're functioning to do whatever work they're designed to do to raw materials, if that energy or that motion is applied to a human, it could seriously harm, am amputate, um, disable, or kill. And so we've got rotating things, we've got in-running nip points, we've got uh, cutting actions, punching, shearing, bending. There's a lot of things that are done. It tends to be all kinetic um, type work. And um, But the problem is, and this, this is a problem that you, you tend to hear about when someone has an amputation that they either disabled or went around a guard or a light curtain presence sensing device in order to adjust a part or a feed or a raw material so whatever the machine's going to do does it properly. And it, they typically don't get hurt the first time. They've probably been doing it for a while. Now, why are they doing it? Because they have to get the part done. They have to meet a quota and they just, they're not taking the time to report to their supervisor or the foreman, plant manager, or the engineering that whatever feeding system, whatever design 
that's feeding in the, the stock material or the raw material is not doing it properly. And so they're trying to uh, control it themselves and they're putting themselves at harm's way. Again, they're focused on the work and not the safety. I talked about that last lecture. Point of operation protection. So, you know, there are places where these are in running knit points where you just have to put in a permanent guard that there's no need for a human to access it. Um, it's just part of the overall uh, machinery. And as you can see, people lose fingers. Uh, other things you can do for point of operation is you can have a two-hand actuator, as you see on the top. What that does is, in order for the machine to cycle or run, a person has to have both hands suppressing buttons. Because if that happens, then there's no hand to stick into the machine. However, workers are smart. They're innovative. They will you know, attach something to one button so they can just you know, touch the other in order and put their hand in. Sometimes you got to put the two-hand actuators away from the equipment so they can't do that. Um, other, now there's new technologies that will detect because you have to be able to press and let up and to press again to make it work. So you can't have one constantly down. So the technology is getting better. Um, if you've seen the movie Eight Mile with Eminem, he's, he's doing using a two-hand actuator and it's a two-person job because there's two people on that machine. So both, you know, I don't know if you remember, but the guy goes up, down. And so they have to, you know, depress both all the buttons at the same time for the um, for the mill or not the mill the uh, uh, we'll talk about those machines later a press jeez press can come down and form the part it's a cold metal bending we'll get into that <laughs> uh, there's other things like uh, barrier guards interlocking guards automatic safeguarding devices um, the big thing with uh, interlocking guards that's where there's a gate and that gate can either be, you know, your typical gate like you see in a fence or just a door that opens and closes to like a, uh, um, a milling machine or CNC machine. But the thing is, um, some people, some companies believe that when the interlocking guard is disengaged and the thing is not supposed to run, that that can act as lockout takeout. And that is not the case at all because there's still energy going to the machine. We'll talk about lockout takeout later. Administrative controls. You, you can move people around. This this is a um, a practice some companies use for uh, to mitigate overexertion injuries or ergonomic injuries. Is to not have a person doing the same thing all day long, but rotate them around. And but there are advantages to doing that. That if you have workers who have skills in multiple positions, it's easier to fill positions when people are gone or when people leave. And there's some other things as well. I had talked about lockout takeout not too long ago. So during operation, you must have guards. But when you're going to do some maintenance or repair on a piece of equipment, then you have to actually use lockout takeout. You have to de-energize. And not just electrical. Every form of energy needs to be complete, completely isolated and released before you go into the machine to do whatever maintenance. And then, of course... If you can't eliminate, and there's even if there's guards, you have to train people that the guards need to be there and why they're there. Um, but if you're going to be using administrative controls, PPE, signage, behavior and stuff, training has to be part of it. And OSHA does require training um, in many of their standards. And I provided you with a resource that shows you how much they require. Um, so t take a quick glance at that. There's a lot there. There's a lot of redundancies in what they require. So that's what's interesting is when you understand the basic requirement for training, it's pretty easy to go to any standard um, and then follow it. Warning signage actually has a requirement. Um, they've really gone to pictograms. Pictograms are meant to show you what the hazard is versus putting it in words because not everybody can read English or read. So it's meant to kind of help, and you can see here, we also have the coloring. Uh, danger is red, warnings orange, caution's yellow, blue is notice, and green is just, you know, reminding people to be safe. And you can see the different pictograms here from crushing hazard to cutting hazard. Should have you guys look for those out in the world now. You'll probably start noticing them. So personal protective equipment, as mentioned at the, at the beginning of the lecture, um, it's the least effective uh, but it's usually the first one they go to. Uh, it's 
you know, studies show that not, you know, controlling, guarding, whatever it might be, whatever the hazard is, is a safer and more effective way. Because let's say there's a cutting hazard. So you make people wear gloves. Well, is it the right gloves? Are they going to wear them? Do they lose manual dexterity? Or maybe they're wearing gloves to prevent cuts here, but then they go to this part of their workstation and there's a rotating hazard. And then the glove could get caught in it and break their hand. So it's there are all kinds of issues. Um, you wear hearing protection because it's really loud, but then you can't hear the alarm when you're supposed to leave or you can't hear the fork truck coming up and the people yelling at you. Uh, for respiratory protection, if you have a pre-existing pulmonary cardiopulmonary issue, it can exacerbate it because it puts extra stress on the um, on the lungs. So there's a lot of ways in which you know the PPE is just it seems like the right thing to do, but you have to really assess the job, do a job hazard analysis, document it, and the results of it have to support the PPE you select, and then you have to develop a training program so that the worker knows how to wear it, how to recognize when it's not effective, how to store it, how to clean it, when to replace it. That all has to be contained, and um, that standard gets cited a lot because usually the employer is just like, eh, hearing protection, eh, hand protection, eh, tie yourself off. You know, they don't think it through. They don't document it. Here, oh, sorry, these are just different forms. You got eye, face, hand. So there are standards that, you know, go with each of these, and there are requirements. You should become familiar with those. They're pretty simple. So every, not everything's here, but there's a lot of it. So, again, selection and training. I had just mentioned this. I probably should have held off a little bit, but I jumped to the chase. Um, but um, this was an easy one to cite because you see somebody wearing something in, in a workplace when I was with OSHA. Go up. So what, why are you wearing gloves? Because of this. What is the cut resistance of these gloves? I don't know. Just leather gloves. Now, you have to select the PPE based on the hazard they're being exposed to. And you may have to get creative because maybe it protects them when they do this, but when they do that, they need a different type of protection, a chemical resistance. Well, are you going to have them change, change gloves or is there another alternative out there? Can you eliminate the hazard? Okay. Okay, so this wasn't as bad as the last one, right? Um, here's again a reminder for the semester project. If you can make, if you can find an older computer system that supports Flash, you can play the OSHA game and then write up your experience and share what your results were for them for the different modules, different scenarios. If you are unable to find that, or if you just don't want to play the game, you can select a topic, and I've got the topics listed right here between lectures 17 and 24. Um, I'd really like to know what your selection is. I put an item into this week's assignment. I'll put one into next week's assignment. Um, so if you're going to if you're going to do the OSHA thing and you've got a computer, boom, you're done. But if you have to select a topic, I want to make sure I can approve it. Um, hopefully, it's something you're familiar with or something you're interested in. That would that would help. <laughs> uh, so uh, just a quick review. I want you to be aware of the hazard control hierarchy and what it represents. And that is that uh, the least expensive is also the least effective. The most expensive is the most expensive, the most effective. But in the long run, you tend to save. Better return on your investment if you're eliminating hazard or doing a really good job of isolating it or substituting. But it, it requires um, somebody with uh, more knowledge, more know-how, more background in order to figure that stuff out. It's not something you just get lucky and remove. Um, so I also want you to know about the requirements for doing job hazard analyses in order to properly select PPE and the training that's needed that goes along with it. Um, so check out those chapters, uh, look at the review sheet and prep for the quiz, and let me know if you have any questions.